I'm Michael Patrick. I primarily do geospatial analysis and design engineering and stuff. And then in my alternate life, I also do welding, fitting. I help out a couple of HVAC crews. So I've got one foot in the science and math world academia and another one in the trades. And uh, I'll let my team introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Adrian Padilla. I'm a developer at Microsoft and I have my uh, drone company. It's called Cascadian Aerial Robotics. Hi, my name is Nassim and I am, I come from a sales background, but I am a student. I'm going to be studying human centered design and engineering at the UW. And we had two, one of our team members just had to leave, uh, Karan Patil, he had to fly back to Arizona. And uh, Skylar Onstott also wasn't able to be here today. And those two guys helped with the Holloens part of this project. Uh, down at the bottom is kind of our whiteboard, our conceptual model of how we would move along. So uh, Adrian, would you like to click the slides? Oh, great. So a uh, little bit of context, this revolution that needs to happen. There's large players in the world, the Selens, et cetera, to adopt all this new technology. And they have a lot of power. They can dictate their suppliers. They write the checks, the vendors, they can in customers. But dealing with any large institution or corporation, sales cycles are years long. So it takes a long time. So that's one way from the top down. But from the bottom up, the, there's a huge amount of the total marketplace that are the individuals, a very small firm, guy with two vans, fabrication, small fabrication shops, uh, contractors, and even individuals that can adopt small portions of technology. And over a very short period of time, as that ecosystem pieces get welded together, uh, pretty soon you have a mob with torches. Right? <laughs> so the problem has to be worked. And we are down in the bottom here working on a specific problem. Next slide, please. So one of Terra Cognito is known territory, uh, frequently doing my work. I get a phone call Sunday night, like show up some random place and an address and something happened and we go in blind. And so this has happened so many times that I thought it would be useful to see using publicly available data or uh, very low cost data like provided by Adrian's company, how much, how much usable information could we drive through a process and get it to the HoloLens? So if I can throw that thing on my head while I'm talking to this guy with a problem and check out his property and I can be texting, you know, Gensco to say, this is where you're going to drop the stuff off. Oop, steep slope, environmental mitigation and all those things. So what we did was we took two types of data and tried to ram it all the way through to the HoloLens. So, so just as a note, uh, the USGS is releasing the just released the 3D EP, which is LIDAR data for like most of the country. So our data that's publicly available is becoming quite uh, incredible. Next slide, please. So I use the Washington DNR uh, King County 2016 LIDAR survey and pulled a point cloud from that. And those are the website. When you pull that area of interest, it gives you this giant, humongous tile as a point cloud. So there's some point, uh, some post-processing that needs to go on. Next slide, please. So the tools I used to do that were some open source tools called Cloud Compare. And in the upper left there, that's the Washington DNR uh, data set. And at the bottom right here in Cloud Compare, is uh, Adrian's data set of the same location taken from a drone. So some of the proprietary tools that were used were PIX uh, 4D, the utilities that interface with the drone, the drone that derive the surface from motion from the imagery, drone imagery. And then I also, just out of convenience, I could have used QGIS, but 
I use Esri's ArcGIS desktop for making the area of interest. And then I had to use the FM tools in ArcGIS Pro to hammer on some conversion issues. Next slide, please. So uh, actually cropping it, this is further down, but some of the problems to get to this point, uh, the difference in height there is actually the difference at sea level because his drone apparently took zero as the takeoff point. Uh, but the spatial reference systems were a bear with this, especially since the drone reported one thing but it was really another, and <laughs> trying to resolve it was incredibly hard. But finally, he went back to the very, very beginning and regenerated the data set, and it popped right into the right place. Uh, lots of different file formats, all different flavors of LAS files, and then eventually through to object files to go to the HoloLens. I uh, had to simplify some of the meshes, uh, coordinate ranges, geographical coordinate ranges can get really, really large. So if you want five centimeters in degrees of longitude, that number behind the decimal point. So sometimes it's just not going to appear in the HoloLens. Uh, one time the data set, the data set just went outside of the HoloLens's field, field of view and we couldn't get it back. Uh, the base altitude uh, clipping, and then the file sizes is always, is how much can you move into that OLO lens and processing time. So next slide, please. So just as a general note, so kind of up in that area there is the point density that you get from the King County LiDAR. So you, that's a car there. So you can kind of see that it's at about a foot, six inches, 18 inches. And then down in the, towards the bottom left there is the drone. And that's probably about three inches. So uh, just hypothetically, how, how much would it cost for you to go out for an hour and survey a site? $200. 200 bucks. <laughs> it's a pretty good deal. So next slide, please. So uh, at this point here, uh, would you, oh, would you like to talk about the drone? Sure. So uh, drone mapping is the new kid in town uh, for uh, GIS and mapping capture. Um, to give a little bit of context on the timeline of, of this, um, there was a laundromat fire a couple months ago, and I went and captured the damage for insurance uh, purposes. And I came uh, with, um, uh, with Ms., um, well, with the whole team here to uh, see if how can we use this data. And the later information uh, that Michael is referring to is, uh, well, pre-existing data. So we knew that it will have the information of how the building was before the fire. So that's why we are comparing these two data sets and also making a comparison between the precision and, and one or another. And as, as Michael pointed out, it is far uh, cheaper and faster to give me the call or give uh, any a remote pilot to do and fly this mission in probably a couple of hours, whether depending, than actually ordering a LiDAR um, data set from a satellite, which is obviously way more uh, expensive and it takes more time Either uh, also if you get it from an aircraft, it's going to be costly in comparison with the, uh, uh, with the drone. In terms of accuracy, well, as Michael pointed out, the uh, ground sample, uh, sampling distance, it seems to be more dense in the drone, and they, wow. the, far more dense. And this is logically because is this satellite LiDAR or aircraft? You know? That LiDAR was an aircraft. Okay, so uh, even though laser is, is way more precise, the fact that the drone can fly much closer to the surface gives this uh, degree of accuracy. Now, Michael is right. We had some issues, especially in the C axis, which is in GPS coordinates is the less accurate. Um, and LiDAR is obviously more accurate than optically capture um, images, 
but that can be corrected using ground control points that you tag with GNSS equipment, which is essentially just a really uh, highly precise GPS, and you feed this information in PIX4D and your model gets to an accuracy that it's maybe, you know, uh, LiDAR will be envy of this. And the other challenge we had was there is a vast environment of different coordinate systems. Uh, Michael helped me correct that uh, because the LiDAR data set and the drone data sets were in two different planes. So you can have your model appear in the other part of the world or up there in the sky or maybe even flipped. So uh, uh, we were able to uh, go through these problems and get it solved properly. Cool, awesome. Um, so I worked on most of the kind of the visual, the UI aspect of everything. Um, I was pretty new. I've never used Unity or any of the tools that we have up here, Visual Studio or anything like that. Um, but basically what I did was I kind of helped with the scaling of the actual model in the hollow lens um, worked on some of the controls, some of the buttons, and kind of what those do in the model, so that way you can kind of uh, get a better representation. I learned a lot in the process. Um, one thing that really excites me about this project is really the real life application of this, is kind of being able to capture a fire and then take it, store it, and you know, when, when you have a fire, you know, obviously you go in, you investigate the fire, see what you can learn about it, see what you can prevent from happening in newer constructions and things like that. And I feel like as we go along and the more fires that we have, the more we learn about these things and kind of, you know, the more we learn about these things, it's nice to kind of go back into, you know, fires that might have occurred in the past and seeing different types of trends and things that we might be able to learn and, you know, better prevent um, in future and newer constructions. Um, so if you guys have any questions, we'll love to open up for questions. So could you cue the, so our goal is to get it to the HoloLens, so could you, uh, it's the slide before, and if you click down in the corner there, you should get the video player. You might have to go to presentation mode to, well, that's fine. That's fine. That's the only way I could get it to work oh, from. Okay. Okay. So here we go. Boom. So uh, we were able to get it in the hollow lens, walk around this site. So we basically, I thought we accomplished our mission, although, you know, there was some 3 a.m. <laughs> work, work being done. Uh, it was non-trivial getting it to the HoloLens, and frankly, if I'm going to go home and try to get it to Amazon Sumerian, they have an AR, VR, web-based application. I'll see how easy that is. So, uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Or, no, we're not finished with the bit yet. But. So, uh, you know, some conclusions is uh, I think most of the stuff that went on in this tool chain, 100% of it is open source libraries and stuff. So it could lend itself very easy to a Python script, which FTPs down that big tile set, clips it out, the area of interest, which could be based on the King County open property map and generate all the way through to a model that your average construction manager or property owner or property manager could use in the HoloLens fairly rapidly and fairly quickly. Uh, I was really impressed with my team. Thank you guys. And it, the joy of a hackathon is getting together with a random bunch of people and you know moving something through. I never thought we'd get as far as we did. And the people on the code end really put their heart into it. They spent a long night working through all the weird issues uh, dealing with the development environment, et cetera. So with that, uh, any questions? Yeah, I uh, got A lot of work, but for me, I'm a little ignorant of how am I going to use this? I mean, what, what is that? What am I able to do? Because now I have this tool that I couldn't do without this tool. So for instance, if we're in a hurry, and I have four trade crews converging on the site tomorrow morning. So who's going to put what, where, in what order, and what time do I want you guys to arrive? 
uh, material orders. I want them to put these over here. I want this to come before this because we're using this before that. These are a decision tree that any superintendent or whatever can do in seconds when they're looking and can see what the parameters are. But if you have to drive to the site or you're just looking at an aerial photograph, an aerial photograph can tell you some things, but not other things. So in the space of a few minutes, he now knows who needs to do what, why, when, where, et cetera. And you gain hours by not having to actually walk out there and figure these th sort of things out. Also, the use case for an accident like this is that you may have an insurance agent on the East Coast that is interested in inspecting this, and you can uh, call a UAB mapper, uh, capture this in an hour, and spend a couple of hours uh, processing the information, and then you upload this information to the cloud. And let's say in about four or five hours, you can have the that uh, insurance agent looking at, at this information and being a 3D model, if you deliver just some photographs, it will eventually you will get to a problem in which, oh, I really wanted to know what's behind this or what. Right. And so uh, given the three dimensionality, you can, the power of rotation and zooming in, you can get all the information that you want. Plus you have all the pictures that were used to stitch this model if you want to, um, if you want to click and see wh which images are uh, that particular point is uh, is generated from, and also you can take measurements and area measurements and volume measurements from these models. So, so the idea here is this is a uh, deployment type product. There's not a database of this, and you just buy your piece. There's a fire. The drone guy goes and records it, and then boom, it's available to, that's the use case. Correct. Yeah. Or if, depending on what, it is, what you're doing, or yeah. just pull down the LiDAR data set from the state, okay, it that may give you everything you need. If, if there's no natural disaster right. or unnatural. Right, and it doesn't need to be an accident. You can have progression. That's one of the things that, that we do. Uh, progression uh, monitoring from stakeholders in a particular job site you can see how the building is progressing in, in the same cloud solution that Pix4D has. You can have a timeline and you click on any point of that timeline and you will see the 3D model of that job site at that particular date. And you can still do measurements and so this annotations. Isn't, you're not just, this isn't an end result. I'm a viewer of data. And I can make decisions from viewing. You're saying this is also an input and it becomes part of the You could pass it down the line, yes. Correct. And the, the HoloLens provides the, uh, well, the ease of use that you can move around the, uh, uh, and maybe in the future we can add uh, functionality to click on some point and click into another and they get the distance between them. And well, the, from there, the possibilities are unlimited, right? This isn't that relevant. It seems to me like we're all gonna need bigger offices in the future as we're tromping around in virtual world looking at things. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, also our process will be visible on our Slack channel, the same as our team name, so you can kind of get blow by blow of the details of what went down. Awesome.